continuing our uh, sermon series on the book of, or on the character of Gideon in the Old Testament. And what we've been doing for the last two, three weeks is kind of walking through his life. And he is an incredible example of how God takes a person living in fear and turns them into a guy fulfilling and embracing his purpose that God has given him in his life. And as we walk through his story, we're kind of walking through it ourselves, hoping we can be transformed the same way Gideon was so that we can do incredible things for the kingdom of God as well. Uh, before we get into today's message, let me recap like I do each week where we are in the story of Gideon, if you've missed any of these. But here's where we are so far with the story of Gideon. Gideon is a guy, he's growing up in Israel in a time when they are weak, um, in a time when they have turned away from God and an invading the force has come in called the Midianites has come in and occupied them. Uh, Israel is on the verge of starvation. Gideon is like everybody else that's in Israel at the time, which is he's a man living in fear. And when we first see him in this book or in his story, he's a guy living in a hole, um, hiding out from the Midianites. And that's where we first find him. Um, an angel of the Lord appears to him and refers to Gideon and says, mighty hero, the Lord is with you. And for the first time, what Gideon hears is who God sees him as. And God sees him as a mighty hero for the kingdom of God. And Gideon's first reaction is this, doubt. Uh, and we see Gideon start to doubt that. Gideon doubts if God still exists. Gideon doubts if God's still involved. Gideon doubts if God has the power to do it. Gideon doubts if God can actually use him because he looks at himself and goes, I have none of these skills. And as we learned last week, God kind of confirms to him, yes, Gideon, I'm alive. Yes, Gideon, I can do these things. And yes, I am active and present in your world. At that point, and Gideon is convinced, God does want to use me. Um, God does see me as a mighty hero, and somehow he's going to use me. And last week, what we saw is God gives Gideon his first baby steps. And his first baby steps of faith is this. He says, Gideon, what I need you to do is I need you to go to your dad's hometown. Uh, you need to go in there, and there's a, uh, a thing to Baal, which is a pagan god, and Asherah, a pole, which is to another pagan god. I need you to go in there, cut those down, take one of your dad's bulls from his, uh, uh, from his flock, take one of his bulls, um, burn those things, uh, make an altar to God, use the wood from these pagan gods, and burn this bull as an offering to God in the middle of town. So where the Asherah pole was and the, and the thing to Baal, you need to rip that down, put, a, put an altar to God, and you need to burn this uh, bowl on there and leave it for the town to see. You need to return these people to God. And that's his first baby steps. And we saw last week what Gideon does. It says Gideon is still scared to death. So he goes at night with 10 of his servants, and he goes and he cuts them down, and he builds the altar, and he burns the bowl um, in the middle of the town. And we see that he accomplishes the first little task that God gives him. Last week, we talked about, here's your card. You need to come up with something you need to remove from your life, your first baby steps. Um, and we had you write down on a card, and I told you this week, remove it from your life. Burn the card when you're done uh, that you've accomplished. And just real quick, hand raise. How many of you through this first week was able to burn your card? So we have like four potential Gideons in the whole audience. This is not looking good for Christ's view, all right? Here's the thing. Baby steps of faith are things that you have to follow through on. There's a cost to them. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about today is there is a cost to these acts of faith. God does expect you to do something more than just go, yeah, I need to remove some things from my life. I need to bring holiness back to this part of my life rather than just think about it and go, yeah, I need to actually taking the baby steps and starting to do it. Today, we pick up Gideon's story. Um, at this point in the story, what has happened where we left off last week is he has now ripped down these pagan gods. He's built an altar, and in the middle of the city, we can picture it right here, the middle of the city, there's an altar to God that he has now burnt this offering to God using these pagan gods' shrines and their little pole that they had. He's used that, and it's in the middle of the town. And what you would assume next happens when we get into today's text is this, that the people are going to come to Gideon and go, thank you so much. Thank you for returning us back to God. Thank you for getting rid of the pagan gods and getting us back on the right track. Thank you for having the courage to do something none of us had, right? That, that's what the next part of the story should be. The reason we want that to be the story, we want that to be our story. We want to know, we want to be assured that when we act in faith, when we uh, take a step of courage for the kingdom of God, we want to be assured that we will be greeted with an audience who claps for us and says, well done. That, that is so good that you did that. Because we want that because we want there to be no risk to our courage. We want there to be no risk to our faith 
and God. And there are a lot of people and there are a lot of churches that have no problem telling you that's what you can count on. There are a ton of people out there in churches that will tell you if you follow God's path for your life, if you leave fear, if you embrace your purpose that God has for you, that you will experience what they refer to as health, wealth, and prosperity. Which is if you just do what God wants you to do, your life will go great. That God will take care of everything else going on in your life and people will applaud for you and you will enjoy life and you will go, this is the best thing ever that I'm actually living out my faith for God right now because the world loves me and everyone claps for me and I'm almost like a celebrity to them because I have the courage that none of them have. That's what we want to be assured of. The problem with that is this, is that the message we find throughout the Bible isn't that. Uh, in fact, what we find in the Bible time and time again is this. There is a cost to being courageous for God. That there is a cost to being a person of faith. There is a cost to acting out in faith and obedience to God with the world that we live in. Taking up Gideon's story, here's what it says. Chapter 6, starting in verse 28, says this. Early the next morning, as the people of the town began to stir, someone discovered that the altar of Baal had been torn, uh, broken down and that the Asher pole uh, beside it had been cut down. In their place, a new altar had been built, and on it were the remains of the bull that had been sacrificed. So the people wake up, and as they wake up that morning, they all crawl out of bed. They come in the middle of the city or in the middle of the town right there. They're going, where's our normal stuff? It's, what happened here? And now there's this altar to God, and they can tell someone has cut down their stuff and used it as firewood for this new altar. In verse 29, it goes on. It says this, the people said to each other, who did this? And after asking around and making a careful search, they learned that it was Gideon, the son of Joash. Bring out your son, the men of the town demanded to Joash. He must die for destroying the altar of Baal and for cutting down the Asherah pole. So the first response we get is this. Somebody obviously rats out Gideon. So one of his 10 trusted guys that he took with him that night to accomplish his first task, somebody of that 10 who he trusted rats him out. So now the city finds out who did it. And then the people's reaction is not, Gideon, you are incredible. Gideon, you're, you're so courageous. Their thing is, go find them and kill them. And so a lynch mob starts in a town, and they show up at his dad's house and go, go get your son and bring him out here because we're going to kill him right now because he broke down our pagan gods. He broke down our gods, and he's built an altar. We're going to kill him right now. And it says this, but Joash, which is his dad, shouted to the mob that confronted him. Little thing, just you miss this in other weeks. When we first read this, Joash seems to be kind of the head of this town, so he kind of is the elder, the, the main voice that the people listen to. So he has some authority here, and he says this. He says, um, but Joash shouted to the mob that confronted him, why are you defending Baal? Why, you ar uh, why you argue his uh, will you argue his case? Everyone, uh, whoever, ple whoever pleads his case, will be put to death by morning. If Baal truly is God, let him defend himself and destroy the one who broke down his altar. So when Joash comes out and he says this, he says, hey, everybody needs to calm down. And he says, I just want you to know, if Baal truly is God, Baal will kill Gideon. Baal will take care of it. He's God. And if God wants to kill Gideon for what he's done, he will kill him. So just let it be. And he does put out this. He says, whoever defends Baal, so he's basically saying, if anyone lays a finger on my son's head, I will kill you. Don't you dare touch him. That's kind of his statement to him is, you're thinking you're going to pull him out and kill him. You touch my son, I will kill you. And then he says, if Baal is God, Baal will take care of it. Baal will take care of Gideon. Baal will kill him this week. He'll be gone. He'll be eliminated because he's God. He can do that. In verse 32, it says this, from then on, Gideon was called Jerub Baal which means let Baal defend himself because he broke down Baal's altar. Now, what happens at this point is this. No one's going to kill him, but now they nickname him and they start to give him a name that they tease him with, which is basically Gideon walks around now, which is Baal's going to kill you. And that's the name they get him. So they don't call him Gideon anymore. They start calling him by this nickname. Now, how many of you had like nicknames as kids that were like unbecoming? You have those? Like, I was Scotty Potty. Did you get those? Yeah. There's still a lot of pain there, okay? 
You laugh, and it wasn't so funny when you're Scott. Okay, no. Here's the thing. People call people names all the time. That's what these people do. As Gideon now has done this, we can't touch him, but what we're going to do is we're going to mock him to death. We're going to tear this guy up, and we're going to remind everybody what he's done, and that, that Baal, our God, is going to kill him. And they all sit around just waiting for the lightning strike to happen. Like, when is it going to happen, and when is Gideon going to be a dead man? Uh, that's what they're all looking out for. Now, this is probably not what Gideon was hoping would be the outcome of his first baby steps of courage, right? He was hoping people would probably clap for him and be like, this is easy, good, everyone's praised. And he's finding out this is tough. Um, people aren't happy. People want me dead. A mob just showed up my dad's house wanting to kill me. This is not easy. But I want you to know this is the regular pattern that we see in the scriptures. Um, there is a cost to following Christ. There is a cost to having courage. There is a cost to your faith. That's what we see in the Bible time and time again. So what I want to do the rest of this morning is I want to answer a couple of questions. And the first one is this. Why is there a cost to our faith? Why is there a cost to living for Jesus Christ? Why do we have to pay a cost for it? And when we understand that, it will help us answer the second question, which is this one. How do we learn to embrace that cost rather than let it be something that breaks us? How is it that we can look at the cost and know we're going to pay a cost and I can embrace that and be okay with that and it can actually build me up rather than break me down where I just go, I'm walking away from God and I don't want to be courageous anymore and I just want to go back to uh, fill, or fitting in with everybody else and not being noticed. How do we learn to embrace it rather than letting it break us? So we're going to answer those two questions. Let's start with the first one. Why is there a cost of courage? If you are going to stand for Christ, if you're going to be a kingdom worker, why does there have to be a cost? And let me tell you the two main reasons I think there has to be, and they're both from the scriptures, and it's human nature. The first one is this, people hate change. People hate change. Um, for instance, I just know the gardeners are going to sit here every week. I know Greg and Ann and the rest of your little groupie right through here, as the couples come through, they're all going to be right there. I know Howard's going to be all the way in the back. I know Anisha and Boy Yang are going to sit right back on that corner. Rick's not usually there, but I know you two are going to be right here in the front. I know you two are going to be there. I know they're all going to be there. You're always going to be right there. You guys are going to be on that end. Um, here's the thing. We are creatures of habit. We like comfort. We like doing the same thing over and over again. If you look at your daily lives, is it not the same routine week after week? Right? You probably get up the same time, you probably shower at the same time, you go to the same job, you get home the same time, you do the same things. Most of us are creatures of habit, and here's what happens. Anyone that starts to change that and get us out of our comfort zone, we don't really like. Whether they're doing the right thing or the wrong thing, it doesn't really matter. If you get, um, I, get me out of my norm, I'm not really liking you right now. So right now, I've had a norm for a year and a half. Steven has showed up. He's broken it. I don't like him, Okay. Let's just be honest. He talks too much. He's in my office. I waste too much time with him. When I go places, he complains about my driving skills and things like that. And I'm just going, yeah, okay. Yep, yep, see? So over the last like three weeks, I've started to build this animosity and hatred for him that's welling up inside of me. And I might get a lynch mob that comes and say, let's kill him. Um, but here's the thing. We hate change. Everybody hates change. When you are a Christ follower, and you are going to live differently than the world around you, and you are going to live a different lifestyle, a different pattern, a different system, and it starts to change other people's things, and they see the change. People don't like it. So there's going to be a cost. There's going to be pushback. Um, John, Jesus says this in John 15. He says, the world would what? They would love you as one of its own if you belong to it, if you would just play the game with them, if you would just do the things that they do but you are no longer part of the world. I chose you to come out of the world, so it, what? Hates you. As a Christ follower, you are a change agent. Christ calls you to be a change agent, so the world's going to some degree have some pushback, and they're going to hate you on some degree because you're going to force them to change, and people don't like that. So there's going to be a cost to having courage. There's going to be a cost of being a follower of Christ. The other reason there's a cost to our courage is this. Some people hate to be exposed. Um, they hate to be exposed. What we do in our lives as well. 
We like to surround ourselves with people who are like us. We like to surround ourselves with people who do the things we do, that act the way we act. The reason we like that is it brings us a comfort. Now, Christians tend to do this a lot where we just surround ourselves with Christians, right? And after a while, all we have is Christian friends. And that's not fully healthy. There's nothing wrong with that, but it's also not healthy because you're not reaching out to non-Christians anymore and having contact. But people of the world that we've all been there before, I don't know Jesus Christ, they like to hang out with people who are doing the same types of things we would consider to be sinful and disobedient to God. They like hanging out with people that are that way because if everyone around me is doing that, I don't have to think maybe it's right or wrong. And no longer do I have to think anything through. I can just act and I can enjoy myself without any consequences or my conscience kicking in. Well, when Christians show up, what happens is this. Your conscience naturally starts to kick in. You have to think through some things. Good example of this, when I met my wife uh, through high school and early parts of college, I surrounded myself with people that liked to do the things that I was doing, that participated in the same things I participated in. Uh, it made me go, even in the back of my mind, because I grew up in a church and all, even though I knew I was doing a lot of wrong things, um, I didn't have to think about it when I was around these guys, because we were all doing it together. Then I met Autumn, um, and Autumn shows up, I'm not a Christian yet, she is, and she is a Christian who actually lives it out. Like, Autumn's just one of those people who's been exceptional, like, her whole life. Um, and just a good person, a good kid. Um, and she shows up, and she starts living it out. And what happens was this. My conscience started to be pricked. And I actually had to start rethinking again and going, crud, this probably isn't the best thing for me to be doing right now. Okay? How many of you guys have married women that have done that to you? Uh-huh. Yep. See? Uh, it was so bad, I remember this, it was so bad, the first time I showed up at my mom's house with, with Autumn and brought her home for the weekend, uh, my mom, the first thing she does, and this is where it's good having her here because she can confirm it, first thing she does is she walks my girlfriend back to the room and she's bringing her stuff in uh, to be in my sister's room, and she says, um, if you were my daughter, there's no way I would ever let you date my son. And then you said something about it, but thank God God's put you here or something, right? Is that how you phrased it? Yeah, thanks, Mom, that really helped. Thankfully, I was such a catch, that didn't even deter her at that point. She was like, I got to have him. So anyway, she's at home with Liberty today, so you can't even talk to her. It's fabulous. Um, but people hate, here's the thing. People don't like to be expo exposed. When Christians show up, you make people have to start rethinking things because they look and they go, that person can do that, and they're not giving in to all these things. And it makes people reevaluate, and people don't like that. Ephesians, Paul says this. He said, it is shameful even to talk about the things that ungodly people do in secret, all right? And then he says this, but their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them. And when he says the light, he's referring to us as Christians, if you look at the uh, rest of the context here. He says, uh, but their evil intentions will be exposed when the light shines on them, for the light makes everything visible, the light starts to show that there is a right or a wrong. Christians start to show in an environment there are rights and there are wrongs. And then Peter writes this in chapter 4. He says, of course, your former friends are surprised when you no longer plunge into the flood of wild and destructive things they do. So they do what? Slander you. It doesn't say they praise you. They slander you because you expose what they're doing. How many of you in here, when you became Christians, lost friendships and all because you started living a different lifestyle? Hey, there's quite a few of us um, that you lost a lot of relationships because they didn't want to be around you anymore and they started to slander you because you started to expose. Not because you were there going right or wrong and you're horrible. That's not the point. Just you being there, not indulging in those things, opens up their mind again. They have to start reevaluating and what I'm doing right or wrong. And so there is a cost to your courage people hate change. People hate being exposed. That takes us to the second question then. How do we learn to embrace the cost rather than letting that break us? And the first part is very important to understand why um, you will receive uh, a cost to your courage. But why, how do we learn to embrace it? Here's the first thing. Accept reality. If you're going to be a Christ follower, there's going to be a cost. If you're going to follow Christ and you're truly going to start living the way he asks you to live, the world around you is going to look at you and go, I don't know how pleased I am about that. Your former friends and the friends that you even currently have are going to look at you and go, what's changed? And some of them are going to go, I don't really like that. 
There's going to be our society that looks at you and goes, that's not the way you should be living. You're a horrible person. I hate you. There is a cost, and the sooner we accept reality that there's a cost to it, the better off you will be, the less likely that the cost will break you. For instance, if I go down here to the corner to the gas station, if I drive up there and put $32 of gas into my gas tank and assume I don't have to pay for it, when I get ready to leave and someone runs over and goes, no, you got to pay for this or I'm going to call the cops, I'm going to be upset if I thought I didn't have to. That was free. What are you talking about? I thought this was free. Why? Because I'm living in a false reality. I'm not living in, in, a, in a true sense of what's happening in reality. If I show up and go, I'm getting $32, I'm going to pay $32, it's very easy. I just go, here it is. It doesn't upset me at all. I know there's a cost of this. It's going to cost me $32 to get this gas. Same thing with your Christian faith. If you become a Christian, you start thinking, when I start living it out, that everything is going to be great, and I'm going to have health, and I'm going to have wealth, and I'm going to have prosperity, and life's going to be fabulous. What's going to happen is you're going to be disillusioned, and you're going to be upset at some point, because it's not going to work out the way you thought it was. But if you go into it going, there's going to be a cost. When a cost arrives, you go, oh, I kind of knew there would be. I just knew there would be. When I became a Christian, I lost literally every friend I had because all the Christians already hated me because I was on a Christian campus and alienated all of them. And then all my other friends hated me because now I became a Christian. I was stuck in limbo land. I had like autumn. That's all I had. I, I was stuck in limbo. I had nobody. Did it make me and break me? No, because I knew the day I became a follower of Christ, I knew that day I'm losing everybody. <laughs> I, I remember that day. The day I went and got baptized, I knew I'm going to lose all my friends because I can't go hang out with them anymore and do the stuff we've been doing. And I know everybody at this Christian college hates my guts, and it's kind of my fault because I encouraged it. So I knew that day, big cost. When I lost all my friends and everyone hated me at campus, did it really bug me? No, why? I already accept the reality. I knew what was coming. And I made the choice. I'm good with that. You can learn to start embracing the cost if you accept reality and start living there. First Peter chapter 2, it says this, for God called you to do good, even if it means suffering, just as Christ suffered for you. He is your example, and you must follow in his steps. And Christ goes, I suffered. If you're going to be my follower, I'm your example, you're going to suffer. Except reality. There's no other way around it. You're going to have some cost to being courageous in your faith. The second way of learning to embrace the cost is this. Accept who your audience is. Accept your audience. So let me ask you a question. When Gideon went and tore down the, the pagan idols and built an altar to God, who was his audience? Who was he performing for at that point? Who was it? Okay, God. Most people would answer people because you think he was doing it for the people, and it's not. He was doing it for God. His only audience was God. It didn't matter what the people thought or what the people did. His responsibility was, God's asked me to do this, I need to go do this so he can see that I did what he asked me to do and I can be faithful in my walk. All right, one of the other ways of embracing the cost is this. You have to know who you're working for. You have to know who your audience is that's watching you. And as hard as it is to get to this place in your life, people don't matter. Christians, what people think of you doesn't matter. Now, it's great if you can live a life of faith and everybody loves you. Fantastic if that can happen. Rarely does that happen. That's why God provided us a church. We need a place that we can come to as our refuge to encourage each other and continue to build each other up and inspire each other. Because when we're out in the world, that's not likely going to be the case if we're living the life that God called us to live. There's going to be times that we're outsiders. There's times where we're going to be isolated. There are times that people are not going to like us. And if your desire in life is, and if you think your audience is to make everybody else happy, can't be a servant of Christ. And I know that's harsh to say, but here's what Paul says. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians. He says, obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people because he says some things he knows is going to offend some people. He says, obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. This is a tough truth. We want to be loved by people. Everybody wants to be accepted by people. Paul says this, if your audience and the audience you're performing for is people, you can't be a servant of Christ. And the reason he says this is this, they will always be in conflict. What God wants and what people want, even good Christian people at times are going to be on a different page than you at times. That's okay. They might get upset with you. 
that's okay if what you're doing is what God's called you to do. All right? You've got to understand who your audience is because if you think it's people, what will happen is God's going to ask you to do one thing, people are going to ask you to do the other, and you're going to have to make a choice. And whoever you think you're performing for is a choice you're going to make. So if it's about people, you're going to make a decision that's going to please people. But if you please people in that decision, you're not going to please God. But if you make that decision to please God, sometimes people aren't going to be happy with you. And you've got to be okay with that. You have to know who your audience is that you're performing for. When you start to get that, it's easier to embrace that there will be a cost to my faith. The next one, um, accept accountability. Who is getting accountable to? God, right? Not the people. People wanted to hunt him down and kill him. The people thought he was awful. People thought he had committed a great sin worthy of death. Gideon knew I was obedient to God. That's all that matters. The only person that's going to judge me when I die, so even if they kill me, the only one that's going to get to judge me is who? God. Uh, it says this in 1 Thessalonians. Paul writes, the purpose, uh, our purpose is to please God, not people. This is key. He says, he alone examines the motives of our hearts. Only God will judge you. You someday will only stand before one person to be judged, and it's going to be God. It's not going to be your parents. It's not going to be your friends. It's not going to be your work colleagues. It's not going to be your neighbors. It's not going to be the person who ridiculed you and beat you down and told you how awful. The only person you will ever be accountable to ultimately is God himself. And so you need to operate under that system knowing the only person I have to be accountable to is God. And whether people like me or not, that's okay because they're never going to be in the judgment room with me someday saying the awful things they say about me now. Only God will. And if I know God's going to go, well done, good, faithful servant, it doesn't matter if all these people hate me because they can't sit in that throne room. Only I and God will be there. Only God will get to hold me accountable. Um, sometimes we think, no, our parents hold us accountable. Teens, I know I'm not supposed to say this, you're not accountable just to your parents, and they're not your ultimate authority. Um, God is. You make decisions based on what you know to be right. And sometimes your parents might ask you to do things that are ungodly, and you have to be able to go, i got to make the godly decision. Um, your boss, adults, isn't always your ultimate authority. God is. Sometimes you might get demoted. Sometimes you might lose a job. Sometimes you might not be able to take a promotion because you know taking it would offend God and it's not what God would want. And you have to be going, he's my authority, not these people. We have all sorts of authorities in this world. We as Christians only have one, and that is God himself. And we need to understand that. The question today is this. Are you willing to pay the cost for having courage in your faith? Are you willing to stand up and be the person God's called you to be knowing there will be a cost associated with it. But I want you to know this today. That is not the end of the story, even though that's where we ended it today. Um, Gideon, at this point, his life gets better. His influence becomes greater from this point on. What we're seeing so far, though, is this, the baby steps. And God is testing out Gideon to go, are you capable of handling the bigger things? Are you willing to pay the cost of these little things before I get you to the big things? And he's going through a testing time, but things will get better for him. But everything in this life that's worth having has a cost. If you want to get in shape, what's the cost? Exercise, right? If you want to get good grades, what's the cost? Studying. If you want to have good kids, what's the cost? Consistent discipline. Okay, that's its cost. If you want to have good finances, what's the cost? Self-control. <laughs> Money, self-control. Okay, controlling your spending. If you want to have a great story about your faith someday, the cost is going to be courage. Are you willing to have the courage to follow through on the things God has asked you to do? That's going to be the cost. Uh, Jesus says this to wrap up in Luke 6. He says, What blessing awaits you when people hate you, when people exclude you, and when people mock you, and people curse you as evil because you follow the Son of Man. Uh, when that happens, he says this, be happy. Yes, leap with joy, for a great reward awaits you in heaven. Jesus tells you, embrace the cost, because you know what the reward is. The reward is you're a faithful servant, and you will spend in the kingdom of heaven. Are you willing to pay the cost for your faith?